Hello my bookish friends! Welcome or welcome back. I am Elizabeth. This is Reading Riley and today we're talking about the top 10 best books of the year! That's right, it's finally here. The best, the top notch, the ones that I would absolutely recommend for someone who has similar reading taste to myself. So this is it. I'm going to give you my top 10. I did rank them, which is really hard to do, but I did. I found a way. I reached deep within myself and I did rank them. I also have some honorable mentions. In fact, I have, I think, 11 honorable mentions. This was really tough, y'all. I, I read a lot of good books this year. So I will tell you those at the end and a, in a little bit less detail, but I wanted to make sure that I mentioned them because they are so good as well. I did find some themes within my reading this year and the things that spoke to me specifically. So if you are new here and you don't know what kind of books that I like to read, mainly it's thriller and horror. I do like a little bit of a sci-fi twist every once in a while, but these I think are all thriller and horror to some degree at least. Um, a lot of grief horror in here, which is one of my favorite subgenres of horror. Stuff with serial killers, stuff that's twisty, a little bit on the weird side in my particular kind of weird, which I don't even know how to describe. Books that have social commentary that are talking about one thing while also revealing some truth in our world about something else completely or something similar or whatever it may be. And that's what I love most about horror is that connection to real life and how we can slightly alter something into the quote unquote supernatural and it becomes this monster, this beast. Real life is full of monsters and beasts. A lot of social commentary in here, uh, a lot of feminist books, and all of these, with the exception of one, which could even be argued, are female-centered stories. And they are all, with the exception of one of them, new to me authors, in the top 10 at least. I will break this up into chapters down below. So if you are looking for specific books or you want to hear about certain things, it's going to make this video a little bit easier for you to navigate. Also, if you're new to my channel, hit that subscribe button and there's plenty more to come next year in 2024. Here are my other social links. Feel free to reach out to me over there as well. And let's go ahead and get into it. Number 10 is Look Closer by David Ellis. I had never heard of this author before, but I started hearing through the grapevine that I needed to read this book as a psychological thriller. It hits the spot. It's being compared to Gone Girl. It's being compared to Strangers on the Train, and it's long. This one is 448 pages, so know that going in. But I have to say I was not disappointed in this. It was a wild ride, so full of twists that I don't even really know how to pitch this to you in a way that sounds reasonable without giving anything away. The one thing that I took away from this was that it was so twisty. This also gives hardcore Joe Goldberg energy from you if you've read the book, if you've seen the TV show. There is a second person perspective from a man in this story. We're following this couple, Simon and Vicky, and they are this well-to-do couple, really. He is a law professor and they live in Chicago and she works to help women against um, violence against women. She, she, I think she's a social worker. Simon is the character that we follow first and I really got sucked into him. He is described as this kind of cool professor. He is dresses more like the students than he does the other professors, but then we also get into the political side of being a professor at a university where you kind of have to network, you have to know the right people in order to get tenured, in order to work your way up. He's not doing so hot in that area. He's got another rival professor that is up for tenure who is just greasy and slinky and hobnobbing with the higher ups and he's not comfortable doing that. The only thing we really know about this couple is that nothing is what it seems and one of them could be a killer. This is also set around Halloween time, or at least this murder is. There's a body of a woman, a socialite, who is found hanging in her mansion in the suburbs of Chicago. Once this body is discovered, Simon and Vicky's secrets start to unravel. A secret whirlwind affair, talk of an inheritance, a very, very, extremely high inheritance. Everyone has motives 
for everything going on here. The thing that I respected the most about this was the way that it was so intricately plotted and so intricately revealed. Once that first big twist happens, it's like, <gasps> okay, let me get back. And you're in it, you're in it. If you have not read this yet, I would definitely recommend it for a wide audience. It could have been a little shorter, yes, but the way that these twists are set up and the way that he misdirects you as the reader, very well done. It's super twisty. And I think a lot of people would enjoy this one. Moving on to number nine. The next book I wanna to talk to you about is Our Wives Under the Sea by Julia Armfield. Hello, sir, would you like to come up? Okay. This is grief horror. Some of the most beautifully languid and haunting writing I have ever seen. If you are in it for the beautiful prose, check this one out regardless because it's so beautiful. It's weird. This is a weird one. Weird alert. If you don't like weird books, you probably won't like this one, but the language is so beautiful. The ocean itself is a character within this, and there's also that horrifying nature of the ocean, of the unknown, just the same as it is with space, <laughs> I guess. We don't know. There's so much we don't know about, and so a lot of the atmosphere in here and a lot of the imagery that she instills has to do with the ocean, has to do with body parts, has to do with, you know, these creepy, translucent sea creatures that are so deep down below that we cannot even identify or get to them. We're following this couple, Miri and Leah, and Leah works for this government agency and she had a mission where she went down on a submarine, went down to the deep depths of the ocean, and she was only supposed to be gone for a certain amount of time, and then she didn't return. And then she didn't return. And then she didn't return. And the whole time, Miri is on land like, hey, y'all, where's my wife? Where is she at? What's going on here? To the point where she thinks that she has lost her, but then Leah returns and she thinks, hey, I got my wife back, thank God. But it becomes very clear that Leah is not the same person that she was when she left. We know that while they were down there, they got stranded. Their vessel was stranded on the ocean floor for a long time. And it seems that Leah has brought something back with her. If I remember correctly, the way that this is split up into perspectives is we're getting Leah's journal, I think, from when she's down there, but that's only told like and little pieces along the way. For the most part, we're following Mira and we're learning about this couple and how they met and how she changed her life and how they fell into this beautiful love. And so when Leah comes back and she's not the same, Miri is grieving. Hence the grief horror. I started this listening to the audio, but I found that the audio just did not suffice, though it was well done. It was a well done audiobook. This writing commanded reverence. It commanded my full attention. And I just allowed myself to sink into them and became a part of this story and it was haunting, so haunting. It isn't obnoxious with the body horror, but I would be remiss if I did not mention the body horror in this. Now don't put this on a pedestal with like The Troop by Nick Cutter as far as looking for that body horror because it's part of that languidness that's kind of seeped into it. It's not so outright, it's not so in your face, but it is haunting. It's incredibly haunting. We do get some like articles. There's one article I think that we get in particular about this woman who is like went into the ocean and came back out and somehow she got squid eggs in her cheeks and she's birthing these squid eggs. And that's kind of unrelated, but also just gives you an idea of the kind of body horror, like thinking of like pores opening up to release this like creature that's using you as this vessel. Um, just that kind of eek, yuck, creepy body horror type stuff. I would recommend this for fans of Eric LaRocca. I would recommend this for fans of Ian Reed if you like that just grotesque, uh, weird out there kind of horror. This is about love. It's about loss. It is weird and grotesque and gorgeous at the same time. Top-notch writing by Julia Armfield. 
Also, as a side note, I have read some reviews that mentioned the open ending. I personally didn't think this had an open ending, but that could just be the way that I read it, the way that I looked into it. So if you're not a fan of open endings, again, this one might not be for you. It's leaving you space. It's beautiful, it's gorgeous, and it's pretty short. Um, how many pages is this? It's 240 pages, so it's pretty quick to get through and just gorgeous. Cannot wait to read more from this author. Let's move on to number eight. The next book that I want to talk to you about is Full Immersion by Gemma Amore. I feel like this one is very underrated. I feel like it does not get talked about enough. And I believe this was the very first book that I read in 2023. And it has stuck with me this entire time. I think this could be categorized as horror. I think this could be also categorized as sci fi. It does have a bit of a sci fi twist. And then it also could be thriller as well. So this is one that's very genre bending, which I love in books. If you can make it all all of those things and do it well. I'm I'm here for it. I am here for it. Also, if I remember correctly, this audiobook was narrated by the author by Gemma Amore and she did a fabulous job of it. This is another one that I don't want to give you too much away. We're following a traumatized woman with amnesia. Okay, she wakes up, she finds her own dead body. Stay with me here. And she sets out to uncover the truth of what happened and who killed her. And all of this time, she is fighting a race against time, against sanity, against crumbling realities and this ever present threat of something that she's calling the silhouette. It's like this thing that's following her and she can only see a silhouette of what it is. We don't know if it is supernatural, if it is real life, like what is going on here? Why can she see her dead body? In what situation can this be true? So it's very interesting going in. I wanna give you a trigger warning on this one for postpartum depression. This does have that kind of unreliable narrator situation and our main character is going through it. So if you don't like stories that kind of rely on using that, then this may be hard for you. I did think it was done tastefully, but it says so much about women who have postpartum depression and what they go through to try to fight for their lives. They are fighting for their lives. So it's very hard hitting in that way, dark in that way. But it's also kind of an adventure. Once we figure out what's going on, you root for her. You root for her so hard. And I just thought it was moving. I thought it was intense. I thought it was vulnerable and just a really beautiful story. If you've not read this one yet, I would highly recommend reading this for horror fans or for sci-fi fans. Number seven. Now, okay, I just realized I have read from this author before. So that would make two authors that I have read from before. So to make that correction really quickly. Um, this is The Book of the Most Precious Substance by Sarah Gran, and I have read her possession novella, uh, Come Closer, but I liked this one so much more. I thought her other novella was good, but this one just really hit the spot for me. There was something about the frankness of this and the realness of this that doesn't care what people think about it and it's just like in your face real. Now this is another one also that is a bit of a genre bender. I don't know how to classify this book. There are certainly aspects of horror, of fantasy, of mystery, of erotica, and thriller throughout. It can't be held down. This book is very mysterious. People don't even know if it actually exists. But if it does, and if it can be found, it promises unlimited power and sexual pleasure. And in this story, we're following Lily Albrecht, who is a down on her luck book dealer. And she's hoping for the sale of a lifetime. She wants to find this book to make all of her problems go away. She's not always been a book dealer. She was an author. She was a writer previously and her book did well. She had this life of privilege. She went to college. She met this man. They fell in love and she married him. His name is Abel. And they had this love the way she describes their love. It had me, it sunk me. They don't have to compromise anything. In fact, by them not compromising, they're constantly making each other better. It's like they fit like this glove. It's the love in fairy tales. Everything is perfect. Until one day Abel is diagnosed with early onset dementia of some kind, um, to the point where he can no longer speak, he can no longer communicate, he can no longer take care of himself. And so she, Lily, has to take care of him, of course. And she's happy to take care of him, but 
she's going through it. She can't write. So she ends up just buying and selling books to try to stay, you know, try to make some money to try to stay afloat to try to help her husband. So when she hears about the book of the most precious substance, she is all for it. She will do whatever she has to do to get this because she needs the money to make her life and her husband's life better to try to get back to some semblance of the life that she once had. So she's very motivated. She's very highly motivated. And she does meet someone along the way who ends up going on this adventure with her. They go around the world, if I remember correctly, meeting different people, trying to get hints, trying to get clues, figuring out where this book is. Does this book exist? It's a 17th century manual on sex magic. So this is where we get in the like, potentially fantasy, like is sex magic real? Probably not. But it is set in the real world. So it takes her from New York to New Orleans to Munich to Paris, searching the dark corners of power where the world's wealthiest people use black magic to fulfill their desires. So now you see how this is like not typical in any way, shape or form. This is very outside of our typical thriller, mystery, horror story. And I love that about it. I also love that this has to do with books. As a reader, I love reading books about books. I love reading books about authors. It was so wholly refreshing. The audio narrator for this is Carol Monda. Now she also may not be for everyone as far as audio narrators go. She does have like this rasp to her voice, which I thought was sexy and sultry, but I can totally see someone saying that she sounds like an old lady. So, you know, wherever you fall on that spectrum, I don't know. But think Lauren Bacall, think Kathleen Turner. That's what she gave me. Overall, I have very few complaints about this other than maybe just a tad in the pacing, but I think this book was fantastic. It was incredibly original and it went there. I definitely think it went there and it had a satisfying ending. Well, in a, in a sense, don't, it, not a happy ending, but a satisfying ending. So keep that, keep that in mind. I generally like endings that don't go the way we expect them to go. Okay, moving on to number six. The next book I want to talk to you about is Next of Kin by Kia Abdullah. I read this one earlier on in the year and since I have read I think four of her books now and she just, she does something so well. She always has a little bit of social commentary. I believe she's a lawyer in real life. There are legal elements to this. So keep that in mind if you don't like that in your thrillers. I would say it's a blend of legal thriller, family drama, and suspense. If somebody told me family drama in a, in a, as a way to describe a story, I'm automatically out. Like I would be uninterested. So I don't want to scare you off with that because this actually had quite a few twists in here that I was not anticipating. At the very end, it just hits you back to back to back. And I was like, whoa, where did this come from? Just when I was starting to think that I knew what was going on, I had no idea. Having read this author several times after now, I understand the way she writes, the way she throws off the reader. And so I can see it coming now. But this having been my first experience with this author, it blew me away. It absolutely blew me away. It's diverse. It has a lot of social commentary. It's just impeccably done. An ordinary working day, Layla Saeed receives a call that cleaves her life in two. Her brother-in-law's voice is filled with panic. He's at his son's nursery to pick up Max, but he isn't there. Your worst nightmare, Layla was supposed to drop Max off that morning at the nursery but she never made it there. She went to work. She went to her regular everyday routine and she left Max in her car for eight hours on the hottest day of the year. Heart wrenching, heart wrenching. Just dropping into this, what? How? And we do get into the legal aspect of this later on as well. So there is always that dynamic with her of socially, what is acceptable, what is wrong and, and right, and then legally what is acceptable, what is wrong and right in the eyes of the law, and then who should be held accountable for that and why. Layla raised her sister essentially. Their mom left them when they were just teenagers and Max is her nephew, her little sister's son. So this is just kind of unforgivable. This tears their family in two. And Layla's always been there for her every step of the way. But this failing is 
devastating. And it's it's something she she cannot bear. You figure out things, connections within this family that we didn't know otherwise. It's so immaculately plotted and it's so devastating. So devastating. But the twists, the twists hit me so hard and it makes you question who you blame and what you think. And I think a lot of people would have differing opinions on this in the end. And I think that's the point of it. She makes you think about it. She makes you think about society and cultural circumstances and um, the fact that sometimes, you know, people are put in positions that and make decisions that are terrible. <laughs> but why do they make those choices? And that's kind of what we're exploring the why as we go through. This is my favorite of the four of hers that I've read so far. I think if you like a thriller with a legal aspect, if you like dissecting uh, morality and moral quandaries and conundrums in general, I think this is one that you're going to absolutely love. Number five, moving on, the next book I wanna discuss with you is The Husbands by Chandler Baker. This was my first five-star book of 2023, and it was such an easy five-star for me. This is social horror, social horror all the way. Um, if you liked The Stepford Wives, I think this is gonna be one that you will be um, attracted to and that you will enjoy. We're following Nora Spangler and she is a successful attorney. But when it comes to domestic life, she does everything. She packs the lunches for the kids. She schedules the doctor's appointments. She knows where the extra toilet paper rolls are, all of the things. And her husband is not necessarily this bad guy. He works hard. He does. But why does she always feel like she's working harder? Like she is the backbone. Like she has to take on the challenges of their lives as well as her own professional career. There's a disconnect there where it just does not feel fair. Nora's also pregnant again, and so they're house hunting. They need to find a bigger house for their growing family. They come across this exclusive suburban neighborhood um, called Dynasty Ranch. And Nora meets up with this group of high powered women. It seems like a lot of the women here are, you know, they are authors, they are surgeons, they are the heads of their households and their husbands seem so considerate. So helpful. When they first enter into this um, community, they see a house has been burned down. There is a wrongful death that these women want to fight back for. And so she's like, okay, well, I'm a lawyer. I can help you guys. Maybe you can help me, you know, get higher on the list to move into this area because it's very exclusive. You have to be invited. So they kind of come up with this deal, though Nora's not particularly comfortable with it because who knows how that's going to turn out. You know, she's like, I'll help, but I don't have control over this, like how this is going to turn out. And I don't want to hurt my chances if something goes wrong. But as the case unravels, Nora discovers this plot that may explain the secret to having it all. A quote in here that I really love is, women can do anything, but they can't do everything. They cannot do everything. We are only human. So this is another moral quandary that asks, what if you could make your partner more supportive? What if you could fix every little annoying habit in a way that allowed you to be your best self? Would you? And so we're talking about agency in here. We're talking about agency and this flips the script because usually in this case, we're talking about men who have the power. Do we blame them for trying to make their lives better? I don't know. That's a question for you if you if you read this. <laughs> I found this incredibly relatable. There were these little mixed media injections of, I think it's like uh, a message board or articles of some kind where these women are having discussions like, am I the asshole? And this is what's going on. And um, people are chiming in. You get to read all of these different opinions about that. And that really sets the tone for what to expect as you read on and throughout. If you like thrillers set in suburbia with rich people problems, I think you would like this. If you like stories that have something to say about feminism, I think you would like this. If you like just good writing. I think you would like this. I think this is another one that's really underrated. Of course, I came to it late. It was published in when? 2021. I loved it. And I've, I've since read several other Chandler Baker books and really liked them as well. She is one of the burgeoning 
authors for myself that I am really falling in love with. Number four on my list is one that probably will not come as a surprise to anybody who follows my channel or has been following my channel for a while. I love this author. This is one author that I have read prior to this year and who I will continue reading and looking out for anything they write. And that is Rouge by Mona Awad. I would consider this beauty horror. It's another one that's on the weird side. So again, depending on your taste level, like what you actually like to read about, if you like kind of weird stuff that really doesn't necessarily give you full explanations, then this is for you. <laughs> And if not, I'm not sure, this might be a little wrong for you, <laughs> but it's perfect for me. I loved this story. I had so much anticipation going into this and it lived up to exactly what I wanted from it. This is said to be a gothic fairy tale. So we are pulling in elements of gothic as well as fairy tale. Our main character is named Belle. So there's a lot of atmosphere in here that is very rich and dark and sinister, but also beautiful. And we're kind of playing with those two things. She, as long as she can remember, has been obsessed with skincare, skincare videos on YouTube. She has one particular um, YouTuber that she follows and is obsessed with. She is obsessed with youth and looking beautiful and I think a lot of us can relate to that. Her mom is white and French from Montreal and her father was Egyptian, I believe. So she grew up looking up to her mother and thinking, I will never be as beautiful as my mother. She had this very strict idea of what she thought beauty was. And as we go on, that idea gets kind of turned on its head. She finds out that her mother died uh, um, in these mysterious circumstances that don't quite make sense. Um, and so she ends up going to California to go to her mom's funeral. And when she's there, she meets these people. It's kind of like this culty, thing and these people run this beauty spa. It's said to be a transformative spa experience, whatever you take that to be. She gets sucked into the spa and it goes downhill from there. It gets wild, it gets intense, insane. <laughs> in a lot of parts, I found the atmosphere to be cozy and terrifying at the same time. Talking about grief and envy and beauty and the expectations we put on ourselves and the expectations society puts on us. Yeah, this says, uh, burning with California sunshine and blood red rose petals, Rouge holds up a warped mirror into our relationship with mortality. Our collective fixation with the surface and the wondrous deep longing that might lie beneath. So I don't want to give away too much. This also was a Midnight Society book club pick this year and we do have a full discussion. I'll link that below and above if you're interested in checking that out. It's 384 pages. Again, I don't think this one is going to be for everyone, but this was my kind of perfect blend of feminism and horror and weird things that we deal with every day, but don't necessarily talk about enough. So I really loved this one. Moving on to number three, we are in the top three now, y'all. I'm so excited uh, and I loved these. And I also think that a lot of people aren't going to have, well, maybe one or maybe one of these on their top of the year, but I think the top two maybe aren't gonna have as much people recognizing their greatness. And so I'm really excited to tell you about all of these. Um, this book came out in 2022. I did not read it until 2023. But I'm now obsessed with this author. And that is Mary and Awakening of Terror by Nat Cassidy. This story is so out there and ridiculous and over the top. Mary is a quiet middle aged woman. I love that she's middle aged as well. We do not have enough stories featuring middle aged women doing her best to blend into the background unremarkable, invisible, unknown even to herself. And Mary has this childhood that she's trying to forget. This is set, well, it starts off in New York City where she lives, but she ends up going back home where she was raised. It says, lately things have been changing inside of Mary, along with the hot flashes and body aches. So she is going through perimenopause, perimenopause, perimenopause. She can't look in a mirror without passing out. And the voices in her head have been urging her to do unspeakable things. She is fired from her job at a bookstore in New York, and she moves back to her hometown to reconnect with her past and her inner self to take care of her aunt in this desert. So it's set mostly in this desert. The atmosphere of once she goes back home into this desert setting really gives me a sundial by Katrina Ward. But when she gets home, 
she starts seeing things. She starts seeing mutilated bodies of dead women just around. And she, she's afraid to talk to anybody. She doesn't want to say, hey, I'm hearing voices. Hey, I pass out when I look in the mirror. Hey, I'm seeing these mutilated bodies. What's going on? Because she's, of course, thinks it's her. She's the problem. But we find that there is a reason for those things. And as we go along, this just gets, it's just wild. It's out there. You cannot go into this expecting to know what's going to happen. You're not going to know. But when it's revealed, it has so much to say. Again, the social commentary in this about women, Nat Cassidy does such a great job. Considering this is a man writing about a woman, a middle-aged woman who's going through perimenopause, he does it so well. He's such a considerate writer and a considerate author. He has a forward and an afterward where he talks about, first of all, his inspiration for this. His idea of this is, is what if Carrie, Stephen King's Carrie, did not have telekinesis and just grew up as a woman. Like what would happen? What's the story after the story? It is a long one, 405 pages. It is a slow burn. Slow burn in the best way though. Everything is constantly accumulating force in this one. And it's so satisfying when we get to the end and we have all these pieces and we put them together and you're like, oh my gosh. I think the thing I love most about this story is Mary herself, her awakening an awakening of terror and an awakening of Mary herself because Mary is more than she thinks. I, I don't think that's a spoiler to say she is more than she thinks of herself. And I love that idea that we are also all more than we think we are. We don't give ourselves enough credit. You know, this just really spoke to me as a woman, as a human being. It just had so much to say and I thought it was so well done. Number two, y'all, we're moving on, we're getting there. Number two for me for 2023 is The Quiet Tenant. This is by Clemence Michelon. I know I said that wrong, I apologize. This one completely took me off guard, completely surprised me. It's hard for books to scare, to legitimately scare me. Like legitimately. This book scared me. This book scared me. This book is about the monsters that are real life people that we are talking to every single day. You may give them their, their coffee in the morning. You may pass them on the sidewalk, whatever it may be. They are here. They are the real monsters. And in this case, his name is Aiden Thomas. And he's a hardworking family man and he's a serial killer. This is not a whodunit. We know Aiden is a serial killer. He's killed eight women. He's handsome. He's very respected in his town. If anyone needs help with something, you know, handy or anything like that, they give him a call. He's there. He's good to his neighbors. He is just all around good guy or so it seems on the outside. He is a widower, um, but he has a 13 year old daughter, Cecilia. And he's also got a woman, Rachel, who has been in his shed for five years. Rachel's perspective is so haunting. And then we're also following another woman, um, a bar owner, a local bar owner, I think her name's Emily, who he is just starting to get to know. She's his regular client. Client? customer. She's kind of got a crush on him, but he's worried about her getting a little too close. When we get the perspective of Rachel, who is the woman in the shed, it's told in second person. It's like she's talking to herself, trying to figure out how to survive every second of every day. She's smart. She's meticulous. She has certain games that she plays in her head of how to react with him in specific situations. She wants him to feel special, to feel like he needs to keep her around. Um, Cause there have been several women, women who he has not kept around. After his wife's death, he finds that he has to leave his home because actually it's owned by her parents. So he has to move with his daughter, Cecilia, and he's got to figure out what to do with Rachel. So he decides after however long, after five years of this, that he trusts her essentially. And he's going to move her with them and tell his daughter, Cecilia, that she's a family friend and they're just helping her out for a little bit. I have heard this compared to Notes on an Execution by Danya Kukavka. I get that reference 100% because we are not talking about the killer. We're talking about the victims and we're getting the perspective. The story is told from the victims, from the women that are closest to him in his, in his life, including his daughter, Cecilia. But this is told like a thriller. This is told like a horror story. It's not as literary 
as Notes on an Execution was, where it's, it's about these lofty ideas. This is told in a way that it's like a typical thriller or horror story, but it says all of those things without having to say them. And so in that way, I think it's way more approachable than something like Notes on an Execution, even though I really enjoyed that one as well. This one I liked so much more. We also get little tidbits, just little bits of points of view from the women who he has killed already. And all of their perspectives are in second person as well. And so after a while, you're hearing you do this. When he comes here, you do that and you do that and you smile and you do this and you do your best to try to draw his attention away and you do that. And after a while, it's you, 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 you. you. It feels like you. It feels like me. It feels like I've been injected into the story and you have this haunting feeling of like looking over your shoulder. It's really making that fear that women have to live with every day. That fear of walking to your car at night. That fear of, you know, wearing something that you think could be interpreted a certain way. The things that we have to think about in order to just get through everyday life in a way that has immediate consequences. Not just ifs, ands, or maybes like we think about, but yes, this has happened. How are you going to get through this? What are you going to do? I thought it was so brilliant. I thought it was brilliant. I loved it. Five stars. Another easy five star. Um, this is listed as thriller, fiction, mystery thriller, mystery, horror, suspense. Um, 303 pages right in the sweet spot as far as length goes for me. Okay, there is a part in here that tells us that informs us as the reader that you have roughly 10 seconds within from being strangled by somebody to get out of that chokehold before you lose consciousness and you also lose the chance to fight back. That is the epitome of what this story is about. It's about teaching each other. It's about the fact that we have to teach each other. It's about the fact that I put that in my review of this to make sure other women knew that so that in case they are ever in a place where they have, they are unfortunately in that situation, they know how to react. It's one of those little bits of information that we put in our pocket and we have to keep it there to keep ourselves safe. And it just makes it feel so real and so terrifying. Oh, it just creeped me out. It creeped me out so hard. And there's so many good quotes in here too. Um, one of Rachel's perspective, the woman who's in the shed, your professor used to treat veterans with PTSD. One day he explains that trauma is what happens after you see yourself die. You witness the story of your own death and it rings so true that you're never the same again. You don't get it until you do. Wow. Another quote from Rachel. Of course you found me. You had to happen to someone and you happened to me. It's just that randomness and that terror. Ugh! I found this one incredibly captivating and incredibly terrifying. So if you're looking for something that's going to freak you out, I recommend this one for sure. And lastly, my number one favorite book of the year. I'm so excited to talk about this one. Another one that I feel like is underrated and another one that has such a strong character voice that I just could not help but to fall in love with. But this also talks about the monsters of reality, the, the real life monsters that are walking around us similarly to The Quiet Tenant. And that is, that's something that really just sticks sticks the knife in for me. Like I, that's what I like to explore when I'm obsessed with human behavior and why people do the things they do. And I felt like this one delved into that in such a unique and original way. Did I even tell you what it was yet? It's Strange Sally Diamond by Liz Nugent. This story was unput downable for me. We're following this, carry of this character of Strange Sally Diamond. She's a quirky character. She is absolutely 100% neurodivergent but she's also had these really rough circumstances that she's grown up in from her childhood. She is very reclusive. She lives at home with her dad. Um, both of her parents, I believe, were scientists of some kind. She only knows what she's been taught by her mom and dad. She takes everything very literally. Her dad dies. She remembers that he said, you know, when I when I pass, just throw me out with the rubbish, throw me out with the trash. And so she does. And then some neighbors come around and find start asking and say, well, what happened to him? She says, well, I, he told me to put him in the rubbish. I put him in the rubbish. And this gains a lot of attention. This gains a lot of attention. People around saying, why would you throw your parents body away like it's trash? And she cannot figure out 
where the disconnect is and why that is so strange because he asked her to do it. So that's kind of the circumstances that we come into, but then we start learning about her past, how she got where she is, the dynamics between her and her father. And there's this really sinister story about her past that she doesn't even remember. Her father left her these letters for her to open in the event of his death. And he says, okay, we'll only open one every however often, every week or something. I can't remember exactly. And so she starts to opening opening these letters and it's giving her insight into her past that she never knew about. And so as she's discovering these horrors of her childhood, she's also becoming independent for the first time in her life. She's stepping into the world. She's learning. She's making friends. She is seeing the world in a way that she never has before, that she's never been able to. And she's finding independence. She's also learning that people don't always mean what they say. Uh, but when messages start arriving from a stranger who knows more about her past than she knows herself, Sally's life will be thrown into chaos again. I don't want to get into that part of it because I don't want to spoil you. But we do get the perspective of a whole other character who I'm not even going to mention because it does kind of give a lot of insight into her past and what happened then. What I will say is that this has such a unique tone for a thriller. One that I have, it's so original. It's not something that I've ever read before. And this was my first Liz Nugent. It makes me want to read more of her books. It's twisty, but not ostentatious. It's not over the top in that way where it's like, ha, gotcha. It's over the top in the way that like, this is real. Holy crap. That's, that's real. This happens. It feels true to life with all of its intricacies and all of its real life horrors. There are discussions in here about genealogy, about the inheritance of darkness. And that's really what got me going. That's what I love to talk about. That's what I love to think about. Why people behave the way they do. This really delves into that. And with our main character being neurodiverse, it's it's more than one level of that. Think of um, if you've read The Maid by Nina Prose, our main co character Molly in there kind of reminded me a little bit of Sally Diamond, but Sally Diamond is a little edgier, I'd say. There's one moment in there that was so poignant for me where we actually see a victim turn into a predator. And that's one thing that I think is really crucial about anyone is that we have choices that we can make and, and people who are predators often were victimized. But there is a moment, there's always a moment where you where they go from victim to predator, where they're making a choice on that. Just because something terrible has happened to you, it is not your fault, but it is your responsibility to make better choices moving forward, to make choices for yourself because nobody else can do that for you. And this story really talks about about that. And also there's this overarching theme of trauma and how we overcome that and how in some instances, like I was just speaking on, it can overcome us as well. So yeah, just a lot of intricacies in there, very psychological and dark and so good. I'm probably going to reread this this year because just talking about it's getting me excited about it again. So I think this, I thought it was phenomenal. Again, I don't think this one's going to be for everyone. I think uh, Sally's character is going to rub some people the wrong way. But being someone who is also neurodivergent, I felt a kinship with her. I felt like I related to her on so many levels. Um, and I felt like she was a victim of circumstance. And I loved how it delved into how that created who she eventually became. And that's it. Those are my top 10 books of 2023. We made it here, y'all. Oh, I'm so glad. Love this video. That's probably my favorite video to make. And it's my favorite video of other people's to watch as well, because you could see a very clear idea of what type of books this person likes when you put it in one year, all of these things. And it can change too. Like my taste has evolved over time. I am into more stuff with social commentary and with about feminism now than I used to be. And that kind of lends to a little bit more weirdness, a little bit more on the literary side from time to time. But um, I'm really happy with these top 10 that I came up with this year. And I, and I stand by them and I'm proud of them and I love them all. So now let's talk about some honorable mentions. I'm going to go through these quickly because I'm just, I've been blabbering and blabbering. I've been sitting here filming for about almost two hours now. 
which is ridiculous. I'm gonna have to edit this like a queen. So I have 11 of these and they're actually not in any particular order. I'm just gonna go through them and make sure I mention them because they are deserving of a mention in this video. I'm gonna see if I can describe it in like one or two sentences. First of all, Mother Thing by Ainsley Hogarth. This is an unhinged woman story. On the literary side, beautiful writing, so many deep, deep quotes that you can take out of context from here and just like reference at any time. Um, and we're following a woman who is being haunted, or so she thinks, by the ghost of her husband's mother. Next, A Dowry of Blood by S.T. Gibson. This is following Dracula essentially across the ages. This one's a little bit more old timey wimey than my typical books, but there was so much commentary in this and I loved what this was saying about women and women in abusive relationships, why people stay in abusive relationships. Um, but we're following Dracula and his consorts, essentially his family across time. And his family starts to feel like they don't have enough agency and so they make some changes. Lessons in Chemistry by uh, Bonnie Garmus. This is following Elizabeth Zott in the 1950s, 1960s. She is a scientist and she is just trying to be as successful as men. She's trying to have a career. She's very singularly minded and she does not really put up with the expectations that other people put on her, but she ends up meeting someone who really gets her. She ends up being a kind of television celebrity cooking person. And so I don't want to talk to you about what goes on in between there, but it is again, very uplifting. Um, Elizabeth Zott is again, not your typical female character. And I love that about her. And this also has an adaptation. The first season is completed at this point, seven episodes, I believe with Brie Larson on Apple TV and it's so well done. I loved this adaptation. Such a good book. So glad I read it. Next we have Follow Me to Ground by Sue Rainsford. This is another shorter story that I read for the first time this year and really loved it. It's a weird one. It's about this woman and her father who live together kind of on the edge of town and they heal people in not traditional ways. It almost got this like magical realism in there as well because they come from the ground, they come from the earth. They're not really human, but they are part of everything. And it's not like an alien story or anything like that. People come to them when traditional medicine or doctors aren't helping them. They come to them and they take the bad things out and they heal people. But as we're following the main character, she's also trying to find out who she is and she's feeling so sensations that her dad cannot help her out with. And for the first time she has been kind of going out on her own and not listening to him. And so something goes awry. We also get kind of interviews from people in the town, which I love. I love the interview style aspect of this because all of the other people are giving you their impressions of her and that family and what they think happened. It's like the small town gossip, very strange, a lot of atmosphere, a lot of imagery to do with the earth and flowers and things that grow and plants and things of that nature. Um, look into it if, if it sounds interesting. It was so good. Also, Never Let Me Go by Kazuo Ishiguro. Oh my gosh, I read that one for the first time finally this year. So good. Literary dystopian. If you've not read this one, there is a twist in there that I want to tell you about so badly, but I can't. But we're following this, these kids where it's like an alternate history. I wouldn't, I want to call it near future, but it's not because it's like set in the past. I don't know how to describe it. Oh my gosh. Goodread says it breaks through the boundaries of the literary novel in general. It's a gripping mystery. It's a beautiful love story. It's also a scathing critique of human arrogance and a moral examination of how we treat the most vulnerable. And it's also exploring themes of memory, and the impact of the past. It was so wonderfully woven. Highly recommend. Obviously, I recommend all of these. The Butcher by Jennifer Hillier. This one was, I love Jennifer Hillier. She's so good. This is not a whodunit, but a why done it again. We know there's a serial killer. We know who it is. And this was a serial killer from the past who is still alive today. It's giving the Golden State Killer the actual like real life story of how that happened. But we're following the family members and how this affects their life. And you would think that if we already know who did it, 
at the very beginning, it's gonna be less interesting. That's not the case at all. It's so interesting. And that's a backlist. A, no a new one that came out this year that I really, really loved was Whale Fall. This is by Daniel Krause. This one um, took me a minute to get into as far as the writing style, but I love what it's doing. This is again, grief horror following this man whose father took his own life in the ocean and he's gonna go put on scuba gear and go down there and try to find the remains of his father this is like a long time after it happened he wants to bring his father back to their house so that he can have the burial that he deserves but while he's down there he gets swallowed by a whale <laughs> and it goes from there. They go through all four stomachs. I think it's four stomachs that a whale has. And it's really about our main character and his grief and his um, process that he's going through to try to understand his relationship with his father. And then it turns into survival. So like, and when you think about it, there's like no way, like there's no way you can get eaten. It's so out there. Each chapter is titled by the amount of air he has left in his tank. And so it gets more and more just anxious and tense. And he starts to not really know what's real and what's not. I, I loved that one a lot. Next, this one I really enjoyed as well. I, I keep saying that I loved all of these. Dear Child by Romy Hausman. This is another one that was compared to Gone Girl. And this is about a woman who was kidnapped Napped. If you like um, The Quiet Tenant and Strange Sally Diamond, I would I would recommend this one to you as well. It's kind of the same along the same lines. This woman was kidnapped and she escapes. She ends up at the hospital where her parents go to identify her, but when they get there, they realize it's not her. However, her daughter that is with her is the like carbon copy image of their daughter and what she looked like at that age when she was kidnapped. She's been with this guy for years and years. Um, so how can that be? That this is not their daughter, clearly, and she's not. But her daughter must be their daughter's daughter. How, how can this be? I think this was um, translated as well, but it was very good and dark. The Whisper Network by Chandler Baker. I listed the husbands in here by her as well. I really loved her debut. The Whisper Network that I just read pretty recently. And this is about women in the workplace. Their CEO suddenly dies. And so someone else is up for CEO. Meanwhile, there's this list going around digitally and this digital list that's being sent around to thousands of people around Dallas, bad men of Dallas, beware asshole Dallas men, something happens as a consequence of this list. And this is again, kind of has a legal element to it that I really enjoyed, but also has a lot of social commentary. Another author that I've already mentioned, Nat Cassidy's newest, Nestlings. This was also a Midnight Society book club pick in November of 2023. And I really loved this one. I didn't love it quite as much as Mary because it was written in third person and I just didn't connect to the character as much, but still so good. The comp titles for this are Rosemary's Baby meets Salem's Lot. It's absolutely horror. And again, he's so considerate in his writing. If you're interested, check it out. And then lastly, I cannot not mention, I think this might be the only memoir that I read this year. And that is Page Boy by Elliot Page. And I, I can't speak enough on how beautiful of a person Elliot Page is. This memoir really delves deep into his existence and the things that he's been through. I just think, I think he's an empath, honestly. I think he is so soft and beautiful and intelligent. And I think any, I think y'all should read his memoir because it's, it's so good. It made me cry. It made me cry. It was amazing. And that's it. Those are my honorable mentions. That's 21 books in total. I hope you found something to add to your TBR today. Let me know in the comments down below if you're going to be adding any of these. Also, let me know what your favorite book was this year. I want to know. I want all the recommendations. Even if you can't come up with one, give me two or three, whatever. Especially if it's thriller, horror, sci-fi, anything in that kind of realm. I would love to hear about it down in the comments below. And that's going to be it for me today, y'all. Don't forget that life is short. So read Riley. Cheers. And goodbye. All right. Let's move on. Mm. You know, how do you catch a cloud? How do you talk properly, Maria? How do you catch a cloud and pin it down? You can't. You just can't. Miller's Thrift. Miller's Thrift.